My name is Vincent Muloy. For the past year, I've worked to understand a man, an activist, a poet, a veteran of the struggle, a fighter, a puzzle, another human being. Dennis Brutus has been fighting with the world for over 60 years. I wanted to understand why. I didn't know of, of Dennis Brutus until two years ago. I met Dennis as an anti-globalization activist. We have conquered apartheid, now we must conquer global apartheid. I learned that he had been an important anti-apartheid activist, central to getting South Africa kicked out of the Olympic Games. Yet, he's not known as a struggle hero. I mean, this is a man who came close to death. Jailed, beaten, and banned for his actions, he was a former comrade to the most famous of our struggle heroes. But he's now one of their fiercest critics. No wonder you. she yeah, is in favor of the world bank because she is one of the beneficiaries. When they set him free, they actually didn't know what they were doing. Freedom is my cause. Many of you have fought similar struggles. Therefore, you must join my cause. Hi, Prof. I'm a bit confused. It looks like we misunderstood each other. I'm going back again to domestic area. <laughs> you're gonna have to be a paparazzi if you're gonna follow Dennis Brutus around. Because he moves so quick, despite the fact that he's almost 80. Here you are. I see you. <laughs> From the Soviet. Don't worry, I'll accept the apology when you're on bended knees. This is the first I know Dennis Brutus the activist, the poet. But as a man, he's harder to find, harder to understand, a challenge to unravel. You never saw my scar, huh? No, I have. Bullet scar. No, shot. I used to be a tea boy at the University of the Witwatersrand. And then I was fired. For me to understand the way you work, what inspires you, what are your goals and ambitions? You know how I make tea? How you make tea as well could be part of it. Uh, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm more interested in to know what drives you. You will get the one where the tea bag broke. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what were you saying? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. Okay, just imagine. Was it worth paying attention? I knew getting closer to Dennis wouldn't be easy. But I never imagined just how hard he would make it. Jane sent me these manuscripts, which I now have to discuss at the launch. <laughs> and I, I barely had time to read them. <laughs> Okay. We better get out of here. I find it ironic that Dennis worked so hard to bring our government to power. And yet now he's so outspoken against them. I'm quite interested to know why they picked you to come and be the keynote speaker. Pure accident. <laughs> After all the big shots had declined, you know, yeah. <laughs> I was just back up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it was when they ran out of people. <laughs> <laughs> and now they're in trouble. <laughs> oh, check this, Prof. I've got you in the same picture of Mandela. Yes, that is a little unusual. Of course, we are in the same picture in the shot on Robben Island. We are breaking stones together, you know. We know that the government in power today is highly sensitive to issues of criticism. The people do not this. We know this. 
criticism, whether it's on corruption and deals in arms, whether it's on the failure in relation to AIDS. This government is committed to a wrong direction, is committed to false and dangerous and destructive and inhumane policies. Land for the landless! We really must be ready. Things are going to get rough. And we have to arm ourselves with the weapons of knowledge, the weapons of awareness, the weapons of activism. My cause is a dream of freedom. And you must help me to make my dream reality. Is not revolution making reality of hope? I think I haven't asked you this question. All right. What makes Danix tick? Uh huh. Well, uh, I I don't know if there's a precise answer to that. I have a heart which beats and a pulse. What makes me do what I do? I suppose I'm interested in social issues, social justice issues. Why? Probably because I grew up with parents who cared about social issues, and so I found myself caring about them. I followed Dennis to his hometown of Port Elizabeth, breeding ground for many of South Africa's activists. I was looking for clues for the foundation of a man We were surrounded, of course, with poverty. There were homeless people. There were people who were thrown out of their houses because they couldn't pay the rent. This is where I used to take my girlfriends, where we used to go dancing. It's changed a lot. It used to be a little Chinese shop. Ha! This is the house I lived in. This one? This one. Of course, I married out of here. My kids, some of them, were conceived here. So it's quite an important place in my life. I'm finding it hard, but intriguing, to imagine Dennis at my age, to picture him as a family man. This is 20 Shell Street, where I spent most of my life, both as a boy and as an adult, and uh, this is also where Nelson Mandela was sheltering when he was being hunted by the special branch. And it's also where Walter Sisulu came to ask me to organize the colored community in support of the African struggle for democracy. The main bedroom was over on the left, and over here was the kitchen and the bathroom. That was really the whole area. My mother used to recite poetry at night as she washed the dishes. And I would dry the dishes, and so I learned to hear words with daffodils or uh, Shakespeare's Quality of Mercy. Unfortunately, I didn't get to know my father very well. The family broke up, and so I was with my mother for the rest of my youth. The school is called Patterson High School. In order to go to high school, because my mother could not afford it, we had to falsify the information about my age. And of course, I remember it now with shame. Yeah, but the, why are you ashamed of it now? Well, of course I'm ashamed. It was an act of dishonesty. But because of the circumstances, you yeah. think it's justified? Thank you, sir. I, I, I think you may actually become a, a good documentary man in your time, you know, but give it a few years or so. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, I was regarded as retarded, and I accepted that I was retarded. And, and it has a rather ugly component. I don't know whether I should mention this. My mother was very protective of me, maybe because I was so dreamy, but my father got very annoyed. So it actually developed a tension 
between my father and my mother over me. My father used to call me. He would say to her, that's your little dumb king, you know. Which had all kinds of implications, of course, that she was giving me preference over him, for instance. And also that I wasn't very bright. <laughs> Couldn't be probably that, that that's the in inspiration to say, I'm going to prove my father wrong. Perhaps. I certainly know two of my heroes are guys who were despised by their fathers and overcome, overcame that contempt. Where do you come from? Where do I come from? I used to be a teacher. You at Patterson High School? Patterson High School. I also went to school at Patterson High School. And then I went to America. I'm now a professor in the United States. Somehow we survive. And tenderness, frustrated, does not wither. Investigating searchlights rake our naked, unprotected contours. I was struck by Dennis's courage, his willpower, his determination to overcome the limitations placed on him by others. Could his childhood explain his sympathy for the underdog, his rage against injustice? There was an episode that was particularly telling. I'm already an adult, standing at the non-white bus stop, and there's an African man standing with me, and a policeman comes along and asks him for his pass. So the policeman takes the pass and tears it in half, and says, now you don't have a pass. There was that kind of moment when you felt that the injustice was so intolerable that you would take a stand. An activist from an early age, Dennis began to focus on inequalities in sport and soon became a thorn in the side of Pretoria's government. In 1963, he was placed under house arrest, but intimidation did nothing except harden his resolve. You've achieved few things. But I'd like to know what were you thinking the moment you said, I'm going to campaign against South Africa in the Olympics. I saw a black athlete jump higher than any other athlete in South Africa. His name was Sirat Sikama. So when I saw a man being kept off the team because he was black, I'm going to challenge it. It doesn't even have anything to do with challenging apartheid. It's about challenging unfairness. Can you remember that when we had a, the national championship in East London, the mayor of East London came forward, and when Dennis Brutus was introduced to him, he, he took it, he put his hand out, and then Dennis spat in his hand. <laughs> so I can't deny it, but I must admit I don't remember yeah. it. So. Chief Rangasamy, as president of SASA, South African Sports Association, and working with Sandrock. This man was central to the sports struggle. I started a, a gymnasium, and uh, immediately we were all on non-racial basis, although those were the apartheid days. We never looked back. It was a huge success. After six years, 1950, we established the South African Non-Racial Weightlifting and Bodybuilding Association. We were intimidated, we were hassled, but the fight went on. I believe our success in challenging apartheid and bringing it to attention internationally actually encouraged people to develop the same challenge in other fields. While jailed for breaking his house burning orders, Dennis Brutus was shot during his second escape attempt. An event that changed his life. I came down Marshall Street, and as I rounded this corner, a bullet came out of my front. It went through me, but I was not aware of that at the time. I kept running. I was bleeding all this time. 
and I'm in really, I guess, rather bad shape at this stage. When I reach about here, I must have collapsed. I don't remember how I did it, but I imagine it was something like this. And I'm looking up, there's the great pile of Anglo-American Corporation over there. And most strikingly, I'm able to see the address. And it says, 44 Main Street. But the ambulance comes, and then they take a look at me, and they realize I'm not white. This is a white ambulance, and so they take the stretcher, put it back in the ambulance, and drive off. But I think I really understood very clearly that it was Anglo-American, and what Anglo-American stood for that had brought me to the predicament I was in, that it was the exploitation of the resources of South Africa, and really the race of the people you exploited didn't matter. It was the ability to exploit them that mattered. Is that what influenced you to go after corporate and capitalism in general? Uh, I think that was one of the moments, because prior to that, my emphasis had been on law, the apartheid system, but the role of the corporations, both in supporting the government and in turn being supported by the government, those two elements come out later. This battle for the weak against the powerful has taken Brutus all over the world. I wanted to see Dennis in combat, to understand his commitment. This took me to Greece to join him for demonstrations against the war on Iraq. So this is Athens and we are to meet Dennis. And of course this is the place where the Olympics were born. So it's quite an interesting city for us. That, that relationship between Dennis and the city and the Olympics and, and of course me. <laughs> looks like it has arrived from New York. Hello, Vincent. I'm Mike at Petropolis. Where's Professor? Yeah. Hi. Unfortunately, Professor Brutus is still in New York because we went, we made it to New York on time. You're kidding us. In the best case, we're going to have a one-day delay. You can't be serious. Green social forum. You're not joking. Uh, you're not joking, are you? I, I wish it was an April Fool's. Uh, the fear at the moment is that man. he might not pitch. It's going to be a big blow, especially for me. You know, I wanted to see him in action. With Dennis held up by a visa problem in America, I decided to do what he would have done anyway and went to an anti-war protest march. Mr. Bush and Blair and, uh, and the rest. I think he's worse than Hitler. Ah, damn, tear gas. Hard on me. It's been a long time since I've experienced tear gas. I've forgotten how horrible it is. I can't help thinking. Why would an 80-year-old man subject himself to these conditions, continually in the firing line? Why do some people keep fighting these battles, while others just ignore them, living peaceful daily lives? What has this fight got to do with Dennis anyway? I wonder if I have the guts to spend my life fighting injustice. I'd like to think so, but right now I do not know. This was it. If Dennis was not on this flight, we would miss the ferry to Crete and the planned blockade of a U.S. military base. We have arrived. Yeah. We have video bags. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. How you doing? I won't embrace you. Of <laughs> <laughs> the camera. Okay. What happened? James. What happened? <laughs> Go ahead.
Have you ever heard me not to have trouble? Okay. Bye. So this is your second time in Athens? Yes, the last time I was here I was unfortunately in much more distinguished company. The deep body man was yeah. with us, who as you know, was <laughs> no, really mad at me because I called <laughs> Kada Asma a gun runner. And more importantly, who else was with me? And one future president, Tabo Mbek. <laughs> at, at Azum, at that time you were still friends. Sort of, because I was buying them beer in London when they were broke. <laughs> they were my friends, I might not have been their friends. You didn't know? <laughs> well, all right, we'll let it go. <laughs> you lost a lot of friends, <laughs> man. Right I'm losing them all the time. <laughs> so you, you think you're going to be arrested soon? It's my own timing, I think. I have to decide when I'm ready. You said you've been arrested in Africa, you've been arrested in Europe, in America. You keep being arrested. Haven't you made your yes, point? It's I mean, to be a bad habit. But, but haven't you made your point, <laughs> no, Professor? Yeah, no, I mean, you. No, far from it, far from it. It's not about me. It's about millions of people getting arrested. It's about people willing to break the law in order to say we believe in justice and we are opposed to injustice. When I was arrested at UCLA in Los Angeles, they arrested me and I said, what are you arresting me for? They said, for resisting arrest. <laughs> <laughs> Even the cab driver's not forget that. <laughs> After his shooting, Dennis visited several prisons, ending with a spell on Robben Island. For a while, I was the tattooed lady of the prison. And warders would come to our section and get me to strip and stare and whistle in mingled pleasure and horror at the great purple bruise that ran from my neck down my back from my neck to my thighs in a purple mass. What was I then? Mute, enduring reproach, heroic endurer, Christianly hero, submissive ass. What was I then that I cannot now imagine, cannot now judge? It was in a small cell like this that I spent my first night uh, at Leocorp prison. But it was in fact made of metal, so it was terribly cold. But while I was there, I suddenly remembered in the cold early dawn that it was the 11th of January, the day of my mother's birthday. And I thought of her with, I think, compassion because I knew that she would be deeply troubled and unhappy with what I was experiencing. She did not disapprove of my engaging in political activities. Her anxiety, I think, was for my wife and my young children because she felt that I owed them uh, some responsibility. How important is your family? in your life? Uh, they're as important as families normally are. But I had to make a choice fairly early on whether I was going to serve the larger society or whether I would choose to serve them and, of course, neglect the larger issues. My wife did not oppose the choice. She reminds me now that if I, she had opposed me, I would anyway have gone ahead. And she may be right about that. Now, Vincent, yes. I, I am convinced that you have to have a shot of me 
just walking with my bags because this is really the story of my life. From boat to bus, train to cab to on the road. When you say families are important as families are, what do you mean? I'm trying to understand what important Right, I, I'm careful here because there are aspects of what we call the nuclear family, which I resent and I dislike. For some people, the ideal family, husband and wife and two kids, for me that's not what life is about. And I think community life is more important than the life of the nuclear family. Look at the window, Professor. I should. People order me around. <laughs> Yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's not only beautiful, it has an enormous history you know, of seafaring, of adventures, of war, of romance. This is a wonderful place to be. In uh, one of my poems, very early on, I talk of myself as a troubadour. You know, a troubadour is one who travels, has adventures. So I saw that as, in a sense, my role. I accepted that. There's a disco as well. So if you find me missing, you know where to look for me. You know. What do your family think about you? The fact that you chose activism uh -huh. over being a father with right. two cars and a swimming pool. Very difficult question to answer. After all, there are eight kids, four boys and four girls. And I think each of them would give you a different answer. Uh, as you know, I have a son I don't speak to. His name's Anthony. Very bright, but we disagree politically quite seriously. What makes Dennis Brutus <laughs> compromise a relationship well, with his know. own kid I don't know where, over the struggle? Where did I compromise? You don't talk to your kid at the moment. And that means compromise? I don't know what it means. What is it? I would say it's the reverse of compromise. What is it? It's taking a stand on a particular principle. That's the reverse of compromise. So you know, Professor, mm -hmm. this is actually not the first time I'm on the ship. Uh huh. I was once on the ship to St. Helena. Really? Yeah. And my father was born there. So your father used to tell you stories about... No, uh, my father never talked to me about St. Helena. Mm. In fact, he never talked to me about much of anything. Oh, yeah? He did try to teach me Latin unsuccessfully. Yeah. I, I wasn't bright enough. So he gave up on me. You know, he really lost patience with me. <laughs> I can't help feeling that for Dennis, his community of fellow activists has become a kind of a family, a less critical family. Good, Good to meet you. Thank you. The health of the forum and to peace. <laughs> Why? I let the English language into the prison alone without teaching. Self taught English in the cell. Yes. Oh, in the cell. In the prison cell, yes. That's so. Um, I, I wrote some of my poetry in prison on toilet paper. <laughs> Unmatching socks is one of life's tragedies. <laughs> I have to take these because of the injury to my gut when I was shot. Uh, I developed what are called adhesions. The tissues, instead of growing normally, they grew together. I have difficulty with digesting and I have a lot of gas. 
if I take various things for gas. Beyond the east, the sunrise. Beyond the west, the sea. And in my heart, the wonder thirst that will not let me be. So if you say the wrong thing, straight away you are taken off the list. Wanderer, poet, romantic, a gentle soul in the heart of a warrior, a heart I find hard to understand. Can you taste it? Then you don't buy it, you just leave. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it was only intended for sampling. You want to provoke emotions in your poets. Or generate. And, or generate emotions. But you don't want to show your emotions. Why is that? <laughs> well, it's a very good reason. As an artist, if you wish to communicate emotion, you must not feel that emotion yourself. Dennis never gave me a straight answer about his feelings, always hiding behind the label of a poet or activist. But I struggled to match his claims of being unemotional with his passionate nature. If you allowed yourself to become too emotional, you became very inefficient. The penalty for excessive emotion is inefficiency. For an activist, efficiency is a very important virtue. People keep asking you, you know, what does it feel like to be an exile? And then they would wait for you to kind of break down and say, oh, my heart is breaking and I'm cut off from my people and so on. And uh, I didn't like that at all. In fact, I resented it. I, in fact, deliberately shut out the awareness that I am an exile. When I was told I could not be a citizen in South Africa, I said, I don't need it. I'm a citizen of the world. Endurance is a passive quality. Transforms nothing, contests nothing. I came out of Robben Island in July of 65. And in July of 66, after a year under house arrest, I was allowed to leave the country. I arrived in Britain on the day of the World Cup Finals. So there I am in the grandstand at Wembley, you know, with the Queen nearby, and uh, I'm watching with 110,000 people in the stadium. The day before, it had been a crime for me to be with more than two people at the same time. So you yeah, have this kind of absurd contrast. But of course, my activism in sport then took off in Britain. It was on court number two at Wimbledon. When I arrived there, I've already made up my mind and you have to make the commitment. So I choose court number two after the second match, after the second set, after the second point. And then very precisely, I would go onto the court. But in the meantime, I am harmlessly doing a crossword. So at the precise moment, I take a whistle and blow it and go onto the court and then began handing out the leaflets to the four players and of course to the, the linesmen, to the ball boys and finally uh, to the umpire. By this time the police had already arrived and were ready to drag me off the court but to extend my time there I went limp of course so they had great difficulty getting me off the court and at six o'clock it was on the national news of the BBC across Britain. Very often the people who ran sport were also very powerful people in the government and in the corporations. So you were really up against the British establishment at an aristocratic level. I was realizing the genius of Dennis choosing sport as a vehicle for struggle. Dennis was arguing for fair play on the sports field, time-honored place of equality and impartiality. It's just a notion that comes to me occasionally. 
that it would be very pleasant to be an old man sitting on a bench in the sun in some little village, exchanging the local gossip. I think I would probably get bored if I did that. And while one contemplates this pleasant possibility, I'm not sure it will ever happen. I bring you a message from the people of Africa and they are saying they are against this war. We are all part of building a global movement for peace. We are here to block the Americans to get into the base because we feel that this base is being used for plane ships, maybe the planes that bombard Baghdad and the other cities of Iraq. And so it seems to me my own persistence deserves, if not contempt, impatience. Yet somewhere lingers the stubborn hope thus to endure can be a kind of fight. I couldn't leave Greece without taking Dennis to the birthplace of the Olympic Games, symbolic of one of his greatest achievements. The Olympics is, is something which is very dear to me. I take it very seriously. It was about idealism and achievement, to go higher, to go faster, to go stronger, you know. This is a great ideal. Human perfection, athletic perfection. I like being here at the birth of the modern Olympics because of my own contribution to the realization of those ideals at a time when the ideals were being betrayed. Dennis was central in getting South Africa excluded from the Olympics in 1968 with South Africa having the support of several powerful countries and the International Olympic Committee, I can imagine how hard it was to get them expelled. The way in which I did it really is worth study. The first stage was to get all the African countries united against South Africa. We do not feel that it would be in the interest of Kenya to take part in the Summer Olympics. Stage two, I meet with the Cuban Olympic Committee and we get the countries of South America united against South Africa. They are just like a group of children who don't want to go to the same party as the South Africans. Stage three, I go to a meeting in New Delhi and we get the Asian countries to unite. Stage four, the Soviet Union said it might pull out. But eventually, the man who was president of the World Olympic Committee, the IOC, is a millionaire in Chicago called Avery Brandage. That's the objective of the Olympic movement, to uh, we invite the youth of the world, that includes South Africa. We build these four powerful pressures, and we go to Brandage and say you have to choose. Either you have South Africa or you have 90 countries pulling out of the Olympics. And Brandes says, if I am the only spectator in the stadium and South Africa is the only team in the Olympics, the games are still going on. The Mexicans said, hey, we spent $90 million building a new stadium. We could have one team in the stadium. South Africans contacted Brandes, they said, Where's our invitation? We never got an invitation. <laughs> Some of them were in Texas, uh -huh. on the border of Mexico, ready to get in the moment the invitation arrived. <laughs> and so, in 1968, Mexico, we had an Olympics without South Africa. 
Dennis's campaign led to South Africa permanent expulsion from the Olympic movement in 1970. I see this as an incredible achievement in the fight against apartheid. And yet he's not celebrated as a hero of the struggle. I keep on having the feeling that some prominent people have ignored his contribution in the struggle, especially the Olympics. How does he feel about that? Well, I really don't feel strongly about it. I think you're right, there are people who know that I made a contribution and have either not admitted it or in some cases actually suppressed it. How do I feel about it? Not particularly strongly either way. It's their choice. And of course one doesn't do things in order to be recognized. You do them because they happen to be important. As Dennis's struggle against injustice has expanded, so has the list of enemies. We have conquered apartheid in South Africa. Now we must conquer global apartheid. I'm amazed by his refusal to bow, to bend, to betray his early principles. By his refusal to back down against incredible forces. ultimately responsible for government. If you respect democracy, if you respect... When people like Manfele over there, and I'm sure Steve Biko is turning in his grave in shame for the corruption that she is a part of, sitting there being used by the World Bank to give the impression that they are Africans who are happy with what the World Bank is doing. No wonder she is in favor of the World Bank because she is one of the beneficiaries yeah, that small you, elite which is allowed to allow the benefit while the please people please are suffering. Now. The people of Tanzania, the people of South Africa are suffering. Is it bitterness? Is it anger that drives Dennis? Anger at the world? Anger? I would not have thought so myself. In fact, I think uh, I managed to stay fairly good-humoured considering the circumstances we're under. I mean, when you think of now, the rate of people dying in AIDS in South Africa, and you have to say, how can this be tolerated? How can any government permit it? So I could be very angry, but I think I stay cool. It's quite of a kind of anger at the bottom, but it doesn't, it doesn't ever boil over. Yo. Dennis has made the U.S. his home. Ironically, it is also the home, the heart of capitalism. I was hoping to see another side of Dennis, the professor, the teacher, the scholar, but I found myself on yet another march. Here we are, one more time, walking around the city. This time it's Pittsburgh, but there have been many others. This is my customary walk from my apartment to my office or to my classroom. It's a pleasant walk. I've done it for more than 10 years. I wondered if the U.S. has become Dennis's home. Nope, I don't have a home. In fact, I would dislike using the word home to describe it. Where's your home? I don't have one. I'm humbled by how my persistence attempts to define or categorize the professor, only meet with his determined refusal to be defined by anybody but himself. I wanted to know how Dennis became a teacher. Your accident, I think, in the sense that if you were black in South Africa, there were not many opportunities for you. If you were a woman, you became a nurse or a teacher. If you were a man, you became a teacher or a factory worker. 
and puts it in the context of the society. I've never seen you in class before, and I must say you look completely a different person. I would like to think I am no different in class than I am outside class. Maybe I'm perceived differently, but my mindset hasn't changed. I'm interacting with people. Will you bring me your paper and we'll talk about it for a moment? Then you might... This young man is a documentary maker. His name is Vincent. And uh, he might want to ask you about your paper, which is on Ngugi Wationgo. I could have stupidly been a doctor. I'm thoroughly miserable. Or a lawyer, which is what my mother wanted me to be, interestingly. But uh, I am satisfied to be a teacher. Professor is just a fancy title. Anyway, good luck and... Uh, it was good having you in the class. I like the fact that I am a poet and a professor and a political prisoner. This is a good combination. Okay. As I say, I'm just doing you this favor. But I regard it as a chore. Uh, what a life. This is uh, quite a good volume. It's the, essential reference to the world's greatest writers and uh, you yours truly is among those in the <laughs> well, the world's greatest writers so Dennis Bruce has been called one of the country's most respected I don't know about that <laughs> respected and important poets well it's a hard world man this is a journal with some poetry I'm continually surprised and impressed by this man, by his achievement, his many facets. I'd like to say that you inspire uh, me, and, and I'd hope certainly that you inspire a lot of young people. Well, I think I speak truth to power in the sense that I will say what I think is honest, even if it makes me unpopular. Now, if that inspires other young people to say, hey, I'm going to speak out. If it does that, then I'm very pleased. But of course, I'm not consciously out there pumping them up. I think you're just denying it. <laughs> to be honest with me, okay. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think you like it. Globalization at work. I admire the energy and the enthusiasm Dennis brings to his life, to his battles. But as we walk the streets of New York, I struggle with the contradiction of being in the center of everything Dennis seems to be against. And yet we're having a good time. This is really funny because... I'm the naked cowboy! I'm the naked cowboy! I'm okay. Your mama? How you doing? Fantastic. I'm from South Africa. I'm from the USA. What, what do you call this? I call this uh, the American dream in motion. Then I finally get it. Dennis isn't just working against the American dream. He's working towards his own dream. A dream of humanity. A vision of peace. A world where wealth doesn't have to mean exploitation. Is it just demonstrations are not permitted? <laughs> now there's just the UN. But you obviously have a history with this place. Yes, more than 20 years. I first came to the UN after I came from Robben Island to testify on conditions on Robben Island. And most of them are exposed to assaults and brutality in varying degree. I'm starting to wonder about the future of the UN. The UN had proved that it was irrelevant in two ways. The Bush government ignored it, but also it's not responsive to the people. My prediction is it can go one of two ways. Increase in credibility, which I doubt, or decrease in credibility, which I expect. The New York Times says there are now two superpowers in the world. The United States is the one superpower, and the other superpower is the people in the streets. Okay, here we go. We are here now at Wall Street and at the New York Stock Exchange because for many people this is the most potent symbol of American power. 
I should add, and I no doubt if some people will disagree with me, we are really talking about a decaying power, a power that in fact is collapsing as we speak because it is a bankrupt power. Our job, of course, is to, to challenge it to the point where we topple it, where we expose the inner rottenness of the system and then break it down. And, and create a new alternative world. The stock exchange, uh, the capitalist system, how do you place it in relationship with South Africa? South Africa emerges from apartheid into a so-called post-apartheid democratic society, and yet that society has not achieved the democracy it set out to achieve. Why not? Because once again, the corporations intervene. The decisions about policy of the South African government are dictated by the World Bank, the IMF, and the WTO. And the result is, of course, a country more miserable now than it was under apartheid. We need a new government. We need a new political power. Here's a cab. Maybe let's get a cab. Taxi. Yeah. <laughs> I see a time when the world is going to change fundamentally, but I may not be around to see that change when people become the dominant force that says, we want peace, we are opposed to war. It will come, but it may not come in my lifetime. I don't expect to see it. That's um, rather sad news, I have to admit. No, not mm. sad. Not sad. As my mother used to say, the young can die, but the old must die. Ah, I'll give you a bit of poetry. From the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Ah, fill the cup. What boots it to repeat? How time is slipping underneath our feet. Unborn tomorrow and dead yesterday. Why fret about them if today be sweet? There are so many, many words I could use to describe Dennis Brutus. There are so many contradictions I've tried to understand. But to me, his philosophy is so simple, so beautiful. Speak for truth, fight injustice, live for peace. His battle is noble. His struggle continues. Our struggle continues. Let us work together that my dream may be fulfilled, that I may return with my people out of exile to live in one democracy of peace. We need a light moment. You got a light moment. Let's go. In this world, built on top of the world, I'm a rebel. For life. This is your point. You were gonna make some mean play. I'm a rebel. I'm getting sick and tired of waiting by the deadly side of the poverty line. Watching truth taking decisions that break my life. Gotta fight for what's mine till the last breath. For what's mine, I'll fight. Mama, don't cry when the hunger thunder strikes. Sons and daughters of slaves who break free from these pyramid schemes. One day we all shall be free. <laughs> <laughs>